Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar on the Build America by America Acts by America preference. This webinar is intended for HUD, CDBG, and RHP grantees. My name is Rachel Mekaton. I'm with Enterprise Community Partners, the host for this webinar. The webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the HUD Exchange along with the presentation and a transcript of what's being said. Please note that participant audio and chat is off. To view closed captions during the webinar, you may click on the CC icon in the controls toolbar. The Q&A function is available. We encourage you to listen to the presentation and enter your questions towards the end of the webinar. We'll respond to questions live at the end of the presentation. If your question is not answered, or if you have additional questions after the webinar, we'll provide instructions at the end on how to access the new BABA Ask a Question Help Desk on the HUD Exchange. So with that, I will pass to our presenters. Awesome, thanks. Hello everyone, my name is Erin Martin. I serve as a Senior Community Planning and Development Specialist in the Office of Block Grant Assistance, State and Small Cities Division. Thank you again for being here today. We understand there are so many questions about the implementation of BABA and I, will, and I think we will address many of your questions today. I do want to remind everyone that CBD Notice 23-12 was posted a couple of weeks ago, and it provides implementation guidance for the Buy American Preference. There are also a, a number of great resources on the HUD Exchange. As trainings are completed, a recording, transcript, and copy of the slide deck will also be posted on the HUD Exchange site. Now I am going to turn it over to Clint. Thanks so much, Erin. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Clint Lighted. I'm part of the Enterprise Community Partners team working on guidance and technical assistance for BABA. We've got a lot of great content for you this afternoon, so I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to my colleague, Chris Andrews, who's going to get us started. Chris? Great. Thank you, Clint. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Chris Andrews, also part of the Enterprise team. Um, excited to be with you here looking at the list it looks like a number of you um, were in attendance a couple of weeks ago when Clint and I provided an overview of the Buy America preference today we're really going to be able to to take some time and and dive into uh, a lot more detail on the implementation um, for CDBG and RHP grantees. So with that, we, we have two primary goals for, for today's session. We want to give an overview of the requirements as they apply specifically um, for CDBG and RHP grantees. Uh, and then we want to walk through the basic steps that you all should be taking uh, in how you implement the BAP and how you implement the, the Buy America preference. For our agenda today, um, we're going to cover the projects and the products that are covered uh, by the, the BABA legislation regulation and the BAP. Um, we're going to talk through the waivers that are in place um, and how to comply with the regulations. And Clint is also going to walk us through some project examples uh, to understand how to determine um, if the BAP applies. Um, and again, for those of you who weren't on it, um, there was a webinar on November 2nd that provided an overview uh, of CPD programs and the BAP. Um, that webinar will be posted to the HUD Exchange by the end of the month. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to watch it, even if you did, I highly encourage you all to go back, look at the slide deck, watch the presentation. Uh, we covered a lot of great detail in terms of the, the overview uh, and the application for different programs. Uh, so with that, what is the Build America Buy America Act? It was enacted as part of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which was signed into law on November 15th 
2021. Uh, and in that act had three primary goals, right? stimulating uh, investments into American manufacturing, bolstering American supply chains, and supporting the creation of jobs for America workers and firms. Right? And that requirement is applicable to all federal infrastructure spending. So first, we're going to review what are the projects, what are the products that are covered by the BAP. Projects covered by the BAP may include construction, alteration, maintenance, and or repair. Uh, and it's important to note that even if the primary purpose of the project is not infrastructure, if it includes an infrastructure component, the BAP still applies. So what do we mean by infrastructure? It is defined in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act as a variety of public projects, including facilities, roads, bridges, as well as other construction, alteration, maintenance, and repair uh, of projects that are using funding administered by HUD. And so what are some examples of different projects that are using CDBG or RHP funds uh, that may be covered by the BAP? So the column on the left-hand side of your screen, those are examples of funded activities that may be subject to the BAP. Rehab of buildings and real property, construction of public facilities and improvements, including infrastructure, you know, streets, sidewalks, utility installation, broadband, transportation infrastructure, activities that may not be subject to the BAP, acquisition of real property if it is only acquisition, uh, relocation or demolition, any public service activity, any supportive service activity, um, short-term payments to prevent homelessness, special economic development activities, administrative activities, and disaster and emergency response. That includes any funding under CDBG DR, CDBG NDR, MIT, or any of the CV funded programs. So what are the products that are, are covered by the BAP? Three broad categories. It includes iron and steel, construction materials, and manufactured products. So if your activity is including any of these products or materials, um, you may need to comply with the BAP based on the requirements and the timeline and the waivers available. So let's move into looking at the project planning requirements and how to make a BAP determination. So the possible outcomes when you're thinking about if BAP does or does not apply to a specific project is, you know, one, you're, you're either determining if BAP applies or if it doesn't. And if it doesn't apply, it would be for one of three reasons. It would be that you can utilize one of of HUD's general waivers. You can utilize a project-specific waiver for all or a portion of the project, or it doesn't apply because the project doesn't meet the definition of an infrastructure project. It might fall into a public service or an economic development activity, um, or it might be tied to your disaster funding. So we're going to walk through this timeline in a, in a lot more detail, um, but we'll start here at a high level of, kind of what this flow chart looks like. So the first step are the funds being used for an infrastructure. If no, the BAP doesn't apply. If yes, continue down to, to step two. Do the committed funds include CDBG or RHP grants? 
If no, the BAP doesn't apply from a CDBG or RHP perspective. It might apply based on the other funding in that project, and we'll talk more about that. If yes, move on to step three. Does the project use any of the products subject to BAP? Iron and steel, construction products, manufacture products. If no, the BAP doesn't apply. If yes, then moving on to, to step four. And that is, did HUD obligate the CDBG or the RHP funds on or after the effective date of the BAP? That is, did you execute your grant agreement with HUD and an honor after the effective date? And we'll review those effective dates for both CDBG and RHP. If no, you know, the BAP doesn't apply. If yes, move on to, to step five. Uh, and is the project, project covered in whole or in part by any of the HUD general waivers? If yes, the BAP doesn't apply for the whole project or that portion of the project covered by the waiver. If no, and move on to, to step six, could the project qualify for a project specific waiver? If yes, you, you can pursue that route and work with HUD in preparing a project specific waiver. But if not, the BAP applies to your project. Clint is gonna talk about record keeping and documentation but we really encourage you for every project that you have and that you're looking at is you go through this workflow to determine does or does not the BAP apply and maintain that documentation of where the BAP doesn't apply. So you can go back and look in your file in a couple of years and be able to document, well, this is where we determined or how we determined that the BAP did or did not apply to that specific activity. So let's go in a little bit more depth on these. So step number one, are the funds being used for an infrastructure project? You know, if yes, we'll continue on to step two. And if no, the BAP doesn't apply, right? The BAP only applies to infrastructure projects. Uh, and again, infrastructure, you can look at the definition, in CPD notice 2312 to understand what would and would not fall into that infrastructure bucket. Um, some examples of CDBG or RHP projects uh, that could be considered infrastructure uh, include any rehab, any maintenance, any reconstruction of buildings or real property, construction or repair of infrastructure, um, or improvements, it might be a water line, a sewer line, other utilities, building roads, bridges, sidewalks, um, could include broadband infrastructure. Um, it could be the construction or the repair of any public facilities, repairing a homeless shelter, building a park, building a senior center. If your project is a public service, I do want to just reiterate, it would not be falling into that infrastructure bucket. You know, we've gotten that question a lot. So moving on, step number two, does the project include CDBG or RHP funds? If yes, we'll continue on to step three. Um, if not, then the BAP, as it applies to CDBG and RHP, does not apply. But you also have to consider if there are other sources of funds from HUD or any other federal agency that are coming into the project, if there are home funds coming into it, if there is DOT or FEMA funding coming into that project, you may still be subject to the BAP and you have to consult the requirements associated with that program or that agency to, to determine you know, what the BAP requirements are for that activity. Step number three, does the project use products that are subject to the BAP? Look at your scope of work, look at your you know, bid documentation, 
determine if that project is going to be including materials that are subject to, to BAP, if there will be iron and steel, if there will be construction materials, if there will be manufactured products. You know, make that determination as quickly as you can. Step four, did HUD obligate, we're going to divide here by CDBG and RHP, did HUD obligate the CDBG funds on or after the effective date of that? That is, did you execute your grant agreement with HUD on or after the effective date of the BAP. And the effective date of the BAP is broken down by the different categories. So iron and steel was effective as of November 15, 2022 for CDBG funds. So if you executed your grant agreement after November 15, 2022, you would need to ensure compliance with iron and steel. For your FY24 appropriation, that also includes specifically listed construction materials. And then for your FY25 appropriation, it will also include the not listed construction materials as well as manufactured products. So look at the date that those funds were obligated and determine which component of the BAP, which products of the BAP do you need to ensure compliance with? And now looking at the same for RHP funding, it's the same except for the date for iron and steel. The effective date for iron and steel for RHP funding is August 23, 2023. So a couple months ago, any any agreement executed after August 23, 2023, you would need to ensure compliance for iron and steel. <clears throat> and then just like CDBG, your 24 appropriation would include specifically listed construction materials and your 25 appropriation would include all four, iron and steel, specifically listed construction materials, not listed construction materials and manufactured products. So step five, is the project covered in whole or in part by any of the HUD general waivers? So the first waiver is, is exigent circumstances. Is there an urgent need to complete the project because of a threat to life, safety, or property? Do you have a shelter um, where in the middle of the winter, the, the boiler broke and there is no heat in the building and you need to get heat in that building? You could likely document that as an urgent need and can use that waiver and you do not need to comply with the BAP requirements. The second is the de minimis small grants and minor components. So first is the total cost of the project, not just the CDBG or the RHP portion, but the total cost of the project equal to or less than $250,000. If so, <clears throat> the de minimis waiver may apply and then the BAP would not apply. Or the waiver can be applied if a portion of the products used in an infrastructure project where the cumulative cost of those products does not exceed 5% of the total cost of covered products used in the project. So what does that mean? So if you have $500,000 of covered products going into your project and you have one component that costs less than 5% or, or $25,000, that one component, you can use this waiver not to comply with that portion of the BAP. The balance of the covered products, that remaining $475,000 or you know, whatever the balance would be, that would still need to be covered by the BAP 
and meet all of the BAP requirements, but that one component does not need to be met if you can document that. And then the final is, is the project being funded by a tribal recipient? If yes, this waiver may apply um, and the BAP is not required for the project. Step six, could the project qualify for a project specific waiver? Um, HUD can issue a waiver based on three categories, public interest, non-availability materials or unreasonable costs. These are granted on a case-by-case -case basis and they require consultation and review from OMB's Made in America office. So what is the public interest waiver? It is requiring the use of an American-made product would be inconsistent with the public interest. Non-availability, the product you need is not produced in the United States in sufficient quantities or to a satisfactory quality to be able to be used. Or if the inclusion, the unreasonable cost waiver is if the inclusion of the American-made product would increase the cost of the total project by more than 25%. If you're meeting one of those three thresholds, you can consider a project-specific waiver. And so what is that waiver process? Um, recommend you begin by reaching out to the CPD BABA team for technical assistance on preparing that waiver request. Um, they will provide guidance as needed on how to prepare your BABA waiver request with all of the information required by the Made in America office. You would submit that waiver application and supporting documentation to HUD uh, via email. There will be likely some back and forth with HUD during the review process um, to make sure that you are meeting the public comment requirement and being ready for final approval by the Made in America office. And then HUD will review all the waivers before they are posted uh, and sent to the Made in America office for approval. If approved, the waiver would be posted on the madeinamerica.gov website. And so now that we've talked through one of those six steps. Let's kind of go back to where we began and, and just walk through it all one more time. And this <clears throat> it's a lot of information. These slides are going to be posted uh, as well. This recording will be posted as well. Um, we encourage you to, to go back to look at it. And again, kind of go through this workflow process for every project that you're considering. So one, are the funds being used for an infrastructure project? Are you doing construction, repairs, alteration, or maintenance to a building, to real property, to infrastructure? If yes, you know, then the BAP may apply. Continue on to step two. If no, the BAP doesn't apply. Do the committed funds include CDBG or RHP? If no, from a CDBG or RHP perspective, the BAP doesn't apply, but depending on the other funding in the project, the BAP may still apply. Step three, does the project use iron and steel, construction materials, manufactured products, the products that are subject to the BAP? If no, then the BAP doesn't apply. Um, if yes, and continue on to, to step four. When did you execute your grant agreement with HUD? And think about that again from the phased implementation timeline where it begins with iron and steel, moves on to specifically listed construction materials, and then by FY25, <clears throat> including all of the covered products. 
when was that grant agreement executed? If that was executed after November 2022 for CDBG, after August 23 for RHP, at the very least, iron and steel would be applying. Is the project covered in whole or in part by any of the general waivers? If yes, then the BAP doesn't apply in entirety, or at least for that portion of the project covered by the waiver. If no, could the project qualify for, for a project-specific waiver? If yes, you can pursue that route of requesting a waiver and working with HUD to make that waiver request. If no, the BAP would apply to the project. And so with that, Clint, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk through project implementation and record keeping. I'm not sure if there's anything else you would like to add there. No, Chris, thank you so much uh, for taking us through all of the steps necessary to determine if the BAP applies to our CDBG or RHP process. And I feel like we have a much better understanding now of those steps that we need to follow in advance to determine if the BAP applies to our CDBG or RHP project. And um, I think at this point, we can talk a little bit more about um, project implementation, record keeping, and start to apply some of what we've learned uh, through these steps as we've gone into more detail. Um, documenting your BAP determination, whether your project ends up being subject to it or not, going through those steps and documenting the determination is critical for all projects. As always, it's important to follow your established record keeping requirements to maintain good records for all of our CDBG and RHP projects. And so with that, you know, I'd like to talk a little bit about operationalizing the BAP requirements locally, you know, bringing us back to, to the local level and determining what we need to do next. So at this point, we should be reviewing our existing procurement policies and procedures to ensure that the BAP requirements are included in our procurement documents and our contracts. It's gonna be important. We know how to determine if the BAP applies now we need to make sure it's in our contracts. The BAP contract language is included in special conditions section of your FY23 grant agreements for CDBG and RHP. Uh, the contract language should be incorporated into all agreements, even if the BAP does not yet apply because of phased implementation. The BAP must be included in all bidding documents, subawards, contracts, and purchase orders for products supplied to complete the work. And that's going to become obvious in a second as we talk about record keeping. Um, where we need to follow our standard requirements for record keeping on all of our projects. Uh, it's important that we maintain detailed compliance documentation that clearly shows how we determine the applicability of the BAP, how we implemented the BAP requirements on our project, and setting ourselves up for collecting and generating and filing good documentation so that we can demonstrate compliance with our BAP requirements um, in our files in the event of future project monitor. So when we talk about documentation and record keeping, what we're really talking about is maintaining copies of all written communication with relevant stakeholders about the BAP requirements. Keep that in your project file. Document and keep detailed notes on your BAP determination following the steps that Chris laid out earlier. And make sure that during the project implementation, you're collecting, reviewing, and filing copies of all the required product certifications for the project as required by BABA based on the determination you made at the beginning of the project. You know, is it iron and steel that we're interested in? Is it construction materials? Is it manufactured products? So you know in advance what paperwork you need to be collecting from your contractors and your vendors and material suppliers. Uh, just very important to, to have that established up front so that you've got a basis in your contracts and in your files to demonstrate that you've done everything necessary to comply with the BAP. So I think it's it would be good now to shift gears a little bit. And I, I know that you know, now that we've got kind of the process established, it's always good to get into a couple of project examples uh, and start thinking through uh, that determination, start thinking through what records we might want to be maintaining. So let's let's go to our first example. I've uh, got a couple scenarios I'd like to take you all through. 
Uh, so the first one, uh, in April of 2025, so we're talking a uh, future project, April of 2025, a grantee awards $100,000 in FY24 CDBG funds and $500,000 in FY22 CDBG funds for the rehabilitation of a community park. So Garden Variety CDBG Community Park Project. The grantee classified all items needed to complete the project, which include iron and steel, manufactured products, specifically listed construction materials, and even other not listed construction materials um, in the project. So with that information, the question before us as a group is, does the BAP apply to this project? So thinking back on the BAP determination process that Chris walked us through earlier, before we get into the specific answers, there are a few important things I wanna make sure that we're considering. So looking at this example, think through some of these questions. First, is it an infrastructure project according to the definition of an infrastructure project? Does the project include iron and steel, manufactured products or construction materials? And at that point, you might need to take a closer look at CPD notice 2023-12, to refresh your memory on the two types of construction materials, because you have the specifically listed and the not listed. You should have time to do that. Um, yeah. Another question is, is the funding subject to BAP? We know we're dealing with CDBG, so um, you know we're looking at phased implementation waiver there. Is the funding source, uh, does it apply to the funding source? Does it apply to the materials and the manufactured products that are going to be used in the project? Another question you're thinking about at this point is, do any of the other waivers apply? So, you know, Chris talked about exigent circumstances. You have this major emergency that's threatening life safety. That might, you know, that doesn't appear to be the case here with the community park. The de minimis and small grants waiver, uh, or, you know, doesn't appear the grantee is a tribal recipient. So all of those questions that we were considering as we looked at the decision tree and the workflow earlier are what we're thinking about right now when we look at this example. So let's go ahead and take a look at our answer. Does the BAP apply to our community park project? So um, the answer is revealed, but let's walk through it. Um, and now that you've had a second to think about it, the project's an infrastructure project. So we know that we are uh, working on a community park project and involves construction. Uh, so it meets the definition of infrastructure. Um, it uses items from each type of product classification. The total budget of the project, $600,000. It includes FY24 CDBG funds. So at that point, the BAP definitely applies to iron and steel. It applies to specifically listed construction materials used in this project. So you've got a BAP project, um, you know, kind of going forward with your iron and steel and your construction materials. Uh, important to note here, though, that the BAP does not apply in this situation to the not listed construction materials and the manufactured products used in this project because CDBG funds were obligated prior to the effective date for those products. Remember, we're dealing with FY24 CDBG funds. So you know, looking back on that timeline for the phased implementation, the not listed uh, construction materials and manufactured products haven't kicked in yet at FY24. Uh, so pay attention to the timelines as well, because that will tell you which certifications you are collecting from your contractors and your vendors during the project. Um, also, this example reminds us that it's important to review our scope of work or other budget documents to determine if uh, materials subject to the BAP will be used in the project. You want to know what's going into the going into the community park project and which materials are subject to the phased implementation waiver. Very critical, uh, these, these details. You really want to you know, get into the, the weeds on that early in the project. Uh, also, remember the products may only be classified into one category, so they're one of the categories, not all of the categories. So put it in the most appropriate category. And when you're doing that, remember that your product classification is based on the product status. What is that thing when it arrives at your work site? Because we know that you know, things go through uh, different phases in construction. So it may start out as a raw material and end up as a manufactured product, but what is it when it arrives at your job site? That's the important part. So I think, um, we're pretty clear on this CDBG park project uh, example, feeling good about it. Let's take a look at one more. So here's a good one. So an RHP subrecipient undertakes a project to provide financial assistance to eligible beneficiaries to pay for recovery housing 
They're paying for monthly rent and utility subsidies. The program budgets $300,000 using FY23 and FY24 awards. Does the BAP apply to this project? So again, before we get to the answer, as you walk back through the BAP determination process we discussed earlier, your key questions here include, is it an infrastructure project according to the definition? Does the project include iron and steel manufactured products or construction materials? Is the funding subject to the BAP based on the phased implementation waiver? So RHP, is it subject to it? Um, and then finally, you know, do the, any of the other waivers apply? You look at exigent circumstances, look at de minimis and small grants, you know, determine if it's a tribal recipient, and then consider your answer. And I think this one's pretty straightforward. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at it. So this example, the timing of the obligation of the RHP funds and the amount of the RHP funds checks out. You've got a couple of factors that start pointing toward BAP. However, question number one, step number one, the project does not involve construction, alteration, maintenance, or repair of infrastructure, such as building and real property improvements. Because that's a no, the BAP does not apply to this project. It's a hard stop right there because it's not an infrastructure project according to the definition. So from a record keeping perspective, you're going to document that determination based on the scope of the example, the nature of the assistance payments that are being provided, what is that project, document that it is not infrastructure, place that in the file, and you've satisfied your obligations uh, under BABA for that recovery housing program activity. So I see that we're receiving a handful of questions over in the Q&A, and that's great. We're going to save some time at the uh, in the, just a few minutes to address some of those live. Uh, but before we do that, I'd like to recap and go over some of the key takeaways from today's webinar. We've covered a lot of information. We've provided some useful guidance on the steps uh, that you can use, not only to determine if, if the BAP applies, but also to um, start documenting your files so that you can demonstrate compliance with uh, the BAP. So let's get into those key takeaways. So first, we learned that the BAP applies to projects that include construction, alteration, maintenance, and repair of infrastructure. That's number one. Then we learned that all components necessary to complete an infrastructure project need to be classified. You know, what are these things that are going into our project? Uh, we need to classify them to identify the items in the project scope of work that might trigger the BAP. So those classifications include, again, iron and steel, your construction materials, listed and not listed, and you've got your manufactured products. Um, finally, it's important that you review your pipeline of projects, both those currently underway and those that are planned. You know, look at the projects that are on your desk and identify which of those projects and materials are subject to the BAP using the steps that Chris walked us through earlier in the presentation. And for more details on each of these items, you can always refer to the CPD Quick Guide that's posted on HUD Exchange or to the CPD Notice. So there's lots of resources available to guide you through the determination and documentation process for the BAP. So we strongly encourage you to review the notice. Notice is critical. That is, that's what we're going by here. Notice CPD 2023-12 and that will help you determine applicability of the BAP at both the project and the product level. Chris walked us through all those steps in the flowchart earlier. It's starting to become much more clear to us uh, what we need to do at the outside of projects. Additionally, make sure that you're documenting the process to determine if the BAP applies. Document, document, document. Record keeping, as always, is very critical on your CDBG and RHP funded infrastructure projects. Uh, if you don't document it, your monitor can't tell that it happened. So make sure that you've got clear documentation, follow the steps and uh, record your determination and then follow up appropriately based on um, how the BAP applies to your project and which of the covered products and materials are involved. Also make sure that you're including BAP language in all written agreements, contracts, sub-awards, material procurement documents. Get that BAP language from your grant agreement for CDBG or RHP. It's in the special conditions section. Get that language, get it into all of your procurement documents and all of your contracts. Um, that's going to set you up for success when you come back to a contractor, a material supplier, or a vendor, and you say, hey, 
I understand that we had iron and steel involved in our community center construction project. Um, can you provide us with documentation, a written certification that shows that the iron and steel is made in America? Um, the contractor may say, well, where does it say I have to do that? And you'll be able to point to your procurement documents. You'll be able to point to your contracts and say, it says right here, we talked about it. It's in the contract. We really need this information. Can you supply it for us? So set yourself up for success. Make sure that you've got your contract language in place. Uh, check your grant agreements for that language and go ahead and put it in all of your documents. When determining if the BAP applies, uh, can't stress this enough. We encourage you to be mindful of the waivers that are already available pursuant to the notice. You've got general waivers program-wide. Some of those may apply to your project. Go through the steps to determine if they apply. If there are exigent circumstances and the time spent in complying would affect the health and safety of the public, the exigent circumstances waiver may apply. Be reasonable, be reasonable about it, but if it applies, it applies to the situation and move forward. If the total project cost is less than $250,000, the de minimis waiver may apply. Also, remember that the phased implementation spreads the effective dates for each of the program funding sources and the materials across the next few years. So be sure to refer back to the program specific timelines for phased implementation when you're making your determinations. Also on the project specific side, those waivers may be available for really, there's three reasons. First is adhering to the BAP would be inconsistent with the public interest or not availability. So covered materials are not produced in the US in sufficient and reasonably available quantities or of a satisfactory quality um, to be used in your project. Document that. Finally, inclusion of a covered material would increase the cost of the overall project by more than 25%. So you'd need to know what it would cost with other materials and you didn't know what it cost with covered materials and document that there would be a, a more than 25% cost increase uh, to go with um, the Made in America materials in order to avail yourself of that project specific waiver type. Finally, grantees should identify sources for materials that are made in America as early as possible. So be looking at your material lists, very important. This way, you'll know early on if you might need a project or product specific waiver. Be sure to refer to the text of Notice CPD 2023-12 for more information about general waivers and project specific waivers. So at this point, I take a brief pause here and invite Aaron from HUD back before we move to Q&A and uh, see if there's anything you'd like to add before we take it further. Aaron? Thank you, Clint. Uh, well, thank you both Clint and Chris for your presentation. Um, I want to take a minute to just reiterate a couple of points uh, that both Clint and Chris have made during today's presentation. First, make sure you are evaluating all of your projects and activities to determine if the BAP does or does not apply and document that decision in the project file. Second, you know, you will, you will want to make sure that you are passing down the BAP requirements to subrecipients, contractors, and vendors. And then finally, if you do have questions after this webinar, you can submit an AAQ through the HUD Exchange for additional guidance. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Clint for the next portion of today's session. Thanks so much, Erin. Really appreciate it. I think at this point, we can, uh, we've got some time here to take a handful of questions from the Q&A. So let's get in there. I'm seeing a couple of good ones here that will lead us off. So I'll go ahead and read the question and then provide you with my best response. Uh, so first question, this is a softball. Will the webinar and presentation recording be shared with the attendees? So absolutely, yes. The webinar presentation, a transcription, a recording, all of that will be posted on the HUD Exchange within one month following the webinar. Uh, we're continually updating things and getting materials out as fast as we can. Uh, anybody will be able to access it from the new BABA webpage on the HUD Exchange. So again, we're developing resources and materials 
uh, very quickly and um, you know look for look for this webinar and the uh, general overview webinar we did a couple weeks back uh, to be on HUD exchange really soon. So great question there. Uh, another question coming in so looks like a good one. So uh, we're looking at a project example in this case. So we've got uh, the question says, if a $200,000 CDBG project using iron and steel is funded with an additional $150,000 in other funding, does the BAP apply to the entire project or just the CDBG portion? So uh, you want to start thinking about walking back through your determination steps and because the total project budget exceeds 250,000, you've got 200,000 in CDBG, 150,000 in other funds, the de minimis and small grants waiver will not apply. So that's not going to be uh, available to you. But in this instance, the BAP would apply to the entire project if the CDBG funds were obligated by HUD on or after November 15th, 2022. So when you look at phased implementation, you've got CDBG funds involved, if those funds were obligated by HUD after November 15th, 2022, you know you have iron and steel, um, the BAP's going to apply to this project. Um, so that's, I think, is a good good example of, of a question that came in early in the Q&A um, before we you know, started going through the steps for um, making our determinations, does the BAP apply? Uh, so we're seeing some other good ones come in here. I'm going to pass it back over to Chris. Uh, he's got a couple of questions that we can address as well. Great. Thank you, Clint. Um, and thank you all. These are, are such great questions that you all are, are sending in. Um, this is a, another timing question. Um, so if a project is using uh, FY21 CDBG funds, but the project started after November 15th, 2022, does the BAP apply? And this is a, a really important distinction. So the applicability date for the BAP is based on the date that the grant agreement was executed. So the date that grant agreement was executed between the grantee and HUD, not the date that the project starts. So in this instance, because the grant agreement was executed prior to November 15th, 2022, the BAP would not apply even though the project is kicking off after November 15, 2022. Let's see, a, another question, um, <clears throat> is there specific subrecipient agreement language for BABA and for the BAP that we should be including in our upcoming 2023-2024 agreements? So grantees may include the BABA language from their FY23 CDBG grant agreements in any subrecipient agreement, any contract agreement, in any vendor agreement to ensure BABA compliance. That language is also included as addend addendum three in CPD notice 2312. So if you have CPD notice 2312 pulled up, I think the very last page include sample language that you can use in any of your agreements with subrecipients, with contractors, with vendors, um, and you can include that language throughout. Uh, Clint mentioned this, but I just want to reiterate, you know, we really encourage you to include all of those BAP requirements in all of your bid forms. If you're having a pre-construction meeting, if you're having a pre-bid meeting, Make sure that all of your stakeholders, everybody working on that project, everybody is on board and understanding what does and does not need to be done to ensure compliance with the BAP. Clint, do you have other questions coming in? Yeah, Chris, we've got a few here. Um, so I'm going to go to this one. Does the BAP apply to contractors and vendors or just subrecipients? That's, that's interesting. Uh, the BAP applies to any entity who is carrying out the activity. So that may include vendors, contractors, or subrecipients. The BAP requirements must be included in grant agreements, contracts, and purchase orders for the work performed or products supplied under the federal award. So again, the BAP applies to any entity that's carrying out the activity. Could be vendor, could be contractor, could be subrecipient, all of the above. 
Um, another question here that we can address, does the BAP apply to CDBG MIT, so the CDBG mitigation or CDBG disaster recovery, CDBG DR? Uh, no, the BAP does not apply to federal funds for pre and post disaster response. So the BAP does not apply to CDBG DR, CDBG NDR, CDBG MIT, or CDBG CV. And for more on that, you can look at CPD Notice 23-12. Uh, Chris, are you seeing some additional questions? Sure, yeah. Um, so a couple of waiver questions. Uh, can you describe the emergency or exigent waiver uh, one more time and, and provide an example? This waiver applies when there is an urgent need by a CPD grantee to immediately complete an infrastructure project because of threat to life, safety, or property uh, of residents and or the community. So in the presentation, um, give an example of a heating system um, going out in a homeless shelter in the middle of winter uh, and that lack of heat in the shelter you know, is a threat to life and safety for those residing there. Um, Another example um, could be a, a door, um, the front door to a multifamily property, breaking, no longer latching. That is a threat to the safety of all of the residents within that property and something that would need to be repaired and completed immediately. And the exigent waiver could be used for either of those. Let's see, uh, another waiver question. Um, when determining the de minimis of a project, do we base the amount off of federal funding for the project or the entire project budget amount? So here, if the covered bat materials for a portion of the project comprise no more than 5% of the total cost of covered materials used in that project, not exceeding a million dollars, the bat can be waived for that portion of the project. Uh, so in the presentation, uh, we gave an example where if the total cost of the covered materials is $500,000, the maximum or 5% um, of what could be covered under this um, minor component and the minimus waiver would be $25,000. So I think it's helpful to put that in the context of a, an actual example. Uh, so imagine a city is using block grant funding for construction of a playground. Uh, and the total cost of materials used in that project is a million dollars. Uh, the city can source pretty much everything they need, um, but they can't find a, a domestically produced um, slide or particular slide for that playground. The slide costs $20,000. Because that is less than 5%, of the total cost of materials being used in that project, that it's less than 5% of a million dollars, the de minimis and minor component waiver can be used to waive the BAP for the slide only. All the other materials used in the project um, still must comply with the BAP. Um, and I think we've got time just before we talk through resources for, for one more question, kind of one more waiver question that's come in a number of times. Uh, do you have to apply for the general waivers uh, or do we do you just document in your records that the BAP didn't apply through any of those general waivers? Um, you do not need to apply. You don't need to submit a formal request to HUD to use any of those general waivers. You do need to document the process by which you determined that that waiver applies and is appropriate and maintain that documentation in your program file. Um, so you don't need to submit a formal request, um, but you do need to maintain that documentation. Flynn, anything else you wanna add before we, we move on to resources? No, I think we've covered a lot of the questions that are coming in here. Um, 
Yeah, I think I think let's talk a little bit more about some of the resources that are available to continue supporting uh, grantees as they're determining applicability of the BAP and how to document uh, their determinations and and com and how to comply with BAPA. Great. Um, <clears throat> there are already a, a number of great <clears throat> resources um, that are out there um, on HUD Exchange on HUD.gov. Um, if you haven't already been to the BABA page on HUD Exchange, I encourage you to go there. I also encourage you to keep going back there. Uh, the recordings of these webinars will be posted. The slides from the webinars will be posted. Um, there are a growing number of quick guides um, that are being posted on the HUD Exchange. Right now, there is the CPD overview quick guide. Uh, and then specific guides for both CDBG and RHP um, that are there. On the BABA uh, on HUD.gov page, that page provides a lot more of the waiver documentation, the complete waiver documentation, if you have questions on that. Um, encourage you all to look at the regs for the BAP, for the Buy America Preference, um, at 2 CFR 184. It is not a long reg, but it is a very, very helpful reg in contextualizing what is required and, and how to make sure you are complying. Uh, and then finally, I think Clint, Aaron, and I have said it a number of times. Um, I really encourage you all uh, to print, have an earmarked copy on your desk of CPD Notice 2312. If you do have questions, I know there were a number of questions we didn't get to today. Um, thank you all for putting in your questions. Um, the AAQ is live for BABA. Um, you can go ahead and submit um, on the HUD Exchange. Um, make sure you're logging in, enter your question. Um, we recommend when you are entering that question, include as much detail as you can, including are you talking about a CDBG program? Or are you talking about an RHP program or a different CPD funded activity? Um, what is the year of that funding? Right, there are a number of waivers that have different timelines. The phased implementation has different timelines based on um, when that grant agreement was executed. So the more detail you provide in your question, um, the more complete um, and faster response uh, you will get. Um, in terms of next steps, um, the materials for our first two webinars in the BABA webinar series um, will be posted um, within one month of the webinar. So the overview will be posted by the end of November. The CDBG and RHP um, will be posted sometime in early to mid-December. Um, we do have a number of webinars coming up for ESG and CSC grantees, for CPF grantees, HOFWA, um, Holman HDF. I do encourage all of you to block off the BABA case study webinar for the end of January. Um, we are going to have a, a webinar of all different scenarios, all different project examples across the CPD portfolio. Uh, and we'll have a chance to walk through when and how and in what way BABA does and does not apply in each of those. So do encourage you all to definitely um, come back for that um, as well as any others that, that may be relevant. Uh, with that, thank you all for being here um, and look forward to seeing you all soon in another webinar um, and seeing your questions and hearing your questions in the AAQ. Um, thank you again and we'll see you all soon.